It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for graduation, Nader Tarani, Dean and Professor at the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union and Principal of NADA, a design practice advancing design innovation, interdisciplinary collaboration, and investigations in material assemblies. Nader's accomplishments are countless, so I will attempt to cover some essential aspects um, in a few categories. And his presence in the Sam Fox School is also timely. He works across many boundaries with a scope not limited to a singular discourse, but rather a collection of paths interlacing allied creative disciplines and rooted in social, economic, and political life complexities. Tarani's education occurred at institutions that embraced discourse in art design and innovative pedagogical structures. He received a BFA and a Bachelor of Architecture from RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. He continued his studies at the Architectural Association of Architecture in uh, London, where he attended a postgraduate program in history and theory and the European Honors Program in Rome. Upon his return to the United States, Nader earned a Master of Architecture in Urban Design from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He was former head of the Department of Architecture at the MIT School of Architecture and Planning from 2010 to 2014, faculty at Harvard GSD, RISD, Georgia Tech, and the University of Toronto. Among his numerous accomplishments, Nader received one of the highest recognitions of artistic merit as the recipient of the 2020 Arnold W. Bruner Memorial Prize from the Academy of Arts and Letters and has been a member since 2021. Nader founded Office in 1986 and later NADA in 2011. For those new to the work of NADA, I recommend that you look at their website. Words cannot adequately define the elegance of the projects and we especially look forward to his upcoming publication, Timely Acronisms, with a discourse on technology, the tectonic, social engagement, and the politics of everyday life. This year, in fact, graduation, what was supposed to be our graduation celebration in the evening, marks Nader's transition from Dean of Cooper Union to a faculty member. He joins us asynchronized and on screen because of a conflicting dinner celebrating his accomplishments as head of Cooper Union for many years. During this time, he stressed the importance of the local and global perspective, encouraging partnerships with the city of New York, and also projecting what he calls monastic qualities of Cooper Union onto a world stage. He says it was not his mission to run the School of Nada, but rather to be one voice amongst many, the mortar between the various discussions, engaging people of different ideological and research platforms to create the circumstances of contact. Nader is a citizen of the world, born in London and belonging to a diplomatic family raised across many cultures, including Pakistan, South Africa, Iran, Italy, and the United States. Lastly, I will underscore Nader as a generous mentor and dedicated educator of many generations. As a young practice working on our first major project, we were coming to terms with a lack of control in architecture, specifically detailing with um, complex team structures. And we faced some tough challenges on a project. Um, we consulted with Nader. Uh, and we expected him to drive us towards an insistence on the perfection of detail. And instead, um, not that that wasn't important, but he focused on the integrity of relationships. And this response and kind of the coaching that he provided really speaks to the kind of person that he is, a reflexive and engaged collaborator. Uh, two years ago, we hosted uh, Grafton Architects to deliver our keynote graduation message with the questions that they asked, where are we from, who matters, and what is collective in practice? And I'd say that we're revisiting those dialogues um, between two worlds from a practice that was founded in a specific place in Dublin on Grafton Street to an architect whose name is unbound by place nada, nothing, yet immersed in the specifics of um, working within a culture, a place, um, and with material specificity. 
uh, please join me in celebrating the graduating class of 2022 with the words of Nader Tarani. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Dean Colangelo, directors Amy Hoft and Heather Woofter, faculty, students, parents, and alumni. It's a great honor to be invited to speak tonight, and my only lament is that I could not be there in person. Nothing could have given me more pleasure than to sit alongside you with friends, colleagues, and students alike to celebrate this occasion with you. Alas, my own farewell party at Cooper Union was scheduled for tonight, and my ultimate fear was that if I did not show up in person, that somehow they would find a loophole to chain me to my current responsibilities for yet another year. And so my absence in St. Louis today will hopefully guarantee my release back into civilian life. I have no special qualifications to speak with authority tonight, but I do so in empathy. After having skipped my own graduations at both RISD and Harvard, I'm deeply moved to be asked to mark this passage of time with you. In effect, I feel as if I'm graduating with you. As a school, you've invited me to reviews, to lectures and symposia, and I've appreciated the depth of hospitality you've brought to me over the years. You've taken me along the Mississippi, to your many museums and a grand tour of the city, and of course, up and around the Gateway Arch, an unforgettable civic experience for me, something that can only be measured by the scale of this continent, not only helping me to overcome my claustrophobia, but doing so by witnessing people of American proportions twice my size going through the same motions. Indeed, empathy does go a long way. Despite the abundance of your hospitality, I'm one of those walking cliches that took a good decade to realize that there was a difference between the University of Washington and Washington University. For that, I wanna launch this speech with a public mea culpa, an apology, and a plausible remedy that one of your own esteemed faculty offered me some years ago. I forget who it was, but they did so gracefully with a four letter word. As I uttered to them Washington University, they calmly looked at me and said, wash you, that's the name we go by. The four letter word is not lost to me, even more so when done with propriety and decorum. After seven years of the deanship at the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture, I've come to learn that the respected title, Dean Terani, is strategically reserved for moments of scorn while the familiar nader is a five letter word of endearment. Schools can create special ecos ecosystems and their insularity can often magnify some things that simply require a bit of distance. But we need to position ourselves within a slightly larger context to get beyond the granularity of these types of academic PTSD. If you relate to what I'm saying, then like me, you are ready to graduate. The graduation speech is a genre, and as I put these words to paper, I'm still wondering where this will all end. After the honors, the thanks, and the introductory graces come the great challenges of life, and then the inevitable words of hope, redemption, and of the human spirit. I'm desperately wondering how to escape this eventuality, but if the trauma of the academic context is actually real for anyone, then that is the space I shall try to resuscitate for redemption. But that's for later. First, let's begin with the fun. Wars are raging around the world and some of us do not realize how we are participant to them. Climate change is irreversible and some will be impacted much more than others while we incrementally evolve as a planet. The inequities that are part of this process are something we can elect to deny as we've done so successfully to date. The demise of the public realm and the systemic privatization of collective interests is a project that is all but complete in this country. And whether your interests are in health, education, infrastructure, or the basic rights to a livable environment, you will need to come to terms with the limits of your agency. The urgency of these challenges are real, but we witness them in slow motion. Some have taken centuries to create, others just decades. But my view on these matters, if not informed by disciplinary issues in which we're immersed, 
is also fueled by the mythologies of America that intoxicated me some decades ago as I set sail for these shores. Indeed, I'm an immigrant that came here with the innocence of blind optimism, with the promise of your educational system and the opportunities they imparted. As fate would have it, not only would a revolution in Iran ensure that I stay here, but somehow, despite my low academic standing, or maybe precisely because of it, I remain today right at the core of the academic context some 40 years on. I'm a brand of immigrant that only some of you may relate to. For those of you who may have lost your country, family, or cultural setting, you may have also gained a correspondent sense of urgency, something that only comes with a permanent feeling of uncertainty, an ethos that becomes ingrained in one's everyday practices. Lest this sound overly dramatic, the momentary trauma of loss becomes translated into something much more perpetual, where the idea of urgency becomes a trope, in part giving you reason to do things here and now, today, while also projecting that onto students and faculty in their pedagogical thinking. That is to say that urgency is something that we need to translate into positive terms today, not only to survive, but in fact, to thrive. The urgencies are in abundance and the list endless. Consider the checks and balances that have all but evaporated. Consider the many men making decisions over the bodies of women. Consider a democracy that is far more respondent to big capital than to its founding principles. Not convinced yet? Then consider the larger historical arc of which we are a part. What happens to a nation when it sees its global dominance in decline? For those of us who came to be part of America's great promise, we were also not ready to see it crest within our lifetime. How do you contribute to this great project when its very principles are being held hostage by the unique circumstances of our time? Some by our own doing, while others the result of externalities far from our control. For those of us invested in the culture of art and in turn art as a culture, there's also a larger question as to how we gain agency under circumstances that our voices are either marginalized in the halls of governance or merely capitalized on in the marketplace. In other words, in what way do art and architecture even matter to the world beyond? How do we build our relevance? And if so, how do we translate what we do to society at large? Among others, our relevance can be translated into two very different types of engagement. On the one hand, a relationship that has the capacity to impact the built and natural environment, the policies that govern not only humans, but other living beings, flora and fauna, the planet included, and a critical rapport between art and politics. And on the other hand, a relationship that commodifies what we do to survive, but also to quantify the value of culture and to underscore the rapport between art and capital. Here, I will loosely borrow a passage from the late Harry Cobb, who identified the predicament of architecture, something which invariably translates into different terms with respect to art, in his own words. Architecture is caught in a conflict. On the one hand, it is impossible for architecture to ignore the ethical obligation stemming from the fact that buildings are intended to be useful. On the other hand, it is fatal for architecture to become trapped in the condition of being merely useful. From the ethical perspective, architecture is contaminated by its art status, while from the artistic perspective, it is contaminated by its use status. Yet this is precisely what makes our art so important in culture. Every work of architecture is inescapably enmeshed in the systems of power and standards of ethical conduct from which its art status demands with equal insistence that it be liberated. The reconciliation of these seemingly irreconcilable demands precisely defines, in my view, that's Harry, the ultimate task of the architect. 
Though Cobb makes reference to art, he does not directly address the wider discipline and more notably the dynamism of its expansive terrain. At the end, art isn't just art, but a constantly transforming discursive terrain with a capacity to engage new media, aesthetics, concepts of beauty and the grotesque, the environment and the advent of history itself as we've witnessed in the revelation of archival work in recent years. And of course, much, much more. In a way, Cobb imports art strategically into architectural discourse, if only to explain how that which is not merely functional still has the capacity to justify itself through other cultural means. And art is his alibi. That said, he falls short of describing the functionality of art in positive terms, because obviously that's not his main agenda as an architect. In a sense, the surplus that goes beyond mere building amounts to architecture, and art is that surplus. But this perspective lends itself as limiting if we are to view it from the perspective of art as a discipline, that which is rarely called on to shelter us, to insulate us, or to attend to our menial needs. Not unlike architecture, though, art too speaks to its histories, its media, and its genre, and yet its functionality is rarely as direct as that of architecture. Whether Bob Ross or Barbara Kruger, we understand that there's a delicate relationship between techniques and ideas. And that if the former builds on the assumed popular mythologies of nature and realism in confluence, the latter builds on traditions of abstraction, dissonance, and politics, however oblique in their expression. But in both cases, there is an audience that is as much constructed as is assumed. And the formation of their message is as much part of their art as is the recognition of the attendant interpretations that build the dynamic of cultural relevance in their work. Not unlike architecture, the nature of representation is always at stake, whether in prose or poetry, or whether invested in process or the logistics of production. The artist's predicament is to distinguish between the instrumentality of the medium as much as its ability to allow us to see the world from different perspectives. Central to this challenge is that each medium is composed of its own arcane languages, its unique techniques and particular debates, all of which we deem important enough to engender the time and dedication of enduring commitments. And correspondingly, there's an equal challenge to cultivate audiences and translate what we do, especially as we witness the waning of art education in the K through 12 learning environment. Thus, with all the sophistication of our higher education and the advanced pedagogies we are so lucky to be a part of, we are still witnessing a systemic weakening of cultural priorities in favor of other cultural arenas. Beyond extraordinary artists, thinkers, and producers, if we wish to give cultural agendas a fair chance, then we also need to become better governors, ambassadors, and translators to expand our audiences. If these predicaments are not sufficient, then let us rehearse for a moment our experiences of the past two years. Since I suspect that despite our physical distance today, we've all been summoned to some form of isolation within the confines of our homes, dorms, or personal spaces. And while the administrators consistently try to paint a positive picture of our connectivity through Zoom, the blasted picture plane through which I'm doomed to address you tonight, we all knew that all we really wanted was the physicality of contact. Now to add to this, as we were incarcerated in our respective rooms, we were witness to the murder of George Floyd among many others who would become the rallying cry for us all to come to terms with a much belated need for social justice. Within the academic context, 
This is translated into a renewed discussion about the role of Western education, the canons that are part of its construction of history and the official narratives that become part of our unconscious. That is the ideological mechanism that builds the certainty of truth in our minds. Because of this, we've had to learn how to reread history, reading in between its lines, as it were, to imagine that the heroic parables of European victory are drawn only from one perspective, while another untold narrative that tells the story of settler colonialism remains woefully incomplete. Within a process that has loosely been called post, anti, and decolonization, all schools are coming to terms with the intellectual challenges of narrating these histories when the very voices of their protagonists have been silenced, redacted, or simply censored. Within our context, this has shown its face in at least two ways. From a local perspective, the absent histories of indigenous and enslaved people remain a stark void to be overcome. If the limited documentation of these cultures have allowed historians to piece together incomplete narratives, then nothing of these cultures has yet been allowed the dignity of canonization. From other global perspectives, as we look beyond the European sphere, those canons certainly do exist. And yes, they're no less innocent than their Western counterparts with power, violence and repression being a central part of cementing the official narrative of their histories. But from our perspective here today, those histories are mostly absent in our Western curriculum and they're politely situated in the realm of specialization. For these reasons, it is a telling sign that the atrocities in Ukraine are perceived as an attack on us, while those in Syria, an attack on others. These are the cultural nuances that we've neatly devised to be able to sleep better at night. Coming to terms with these questions, all deeply ideological in many ways, will not happen overnight. But a first step, the mere acknowledgement that they exist as issues to be confronted. Redemption? No, not yet. Let's return back to Harry Cobb for a moment because there's also a telling response to these issues within academia. And interestingly, they tend to blur the lines uh, of progressive and conservative politics. On the one hand, there's a cry to overturn all forms of traditional representation in great part because of their historic alliances with colonial practices. In architecture, for instance, cartography and plan making become challenged as they serve as the main conduit for the deployment of such things as gerrymandering and redlining. Similarly, in pictorial representation, the perspectival conical projection is catapulted out into obsolescence for its centering of subjectivity, that is through the singularity of a station point. And of course, there's no doubt that these forms of representation are indeed ideologically bound in some way. That is the nature of all cultural production. But the question is what types of shadows do they actually cast? To come to terms with the history of representation, we must not forget the complex histories that underlie reductivist narratives. They stand to tell other stories that are often eclipsed. Consider the Annal School and the contributions of Fernand Brodel, whose focus was not so much on the victors of war, but on the everyday practices that documented the stories of trade, uh, the exchange of languages, and the shared forms of knowledge that ensued. Their reading of the Renaissance stands to recenter the narrative entirely. Embedded in their narrative, we find histories of mathematics and geometry that traveled from the Middle East to Europe in complex networks, revealing the Mediterranean as a basin with multiple points of convergence, a dispersed constellation, all peripheral to an unlocatable center. For this reason, Rodell's history remains an important one for us today 
because it gives us the ability to see from the other's perspective as part of its very construct. The very nature of representation is also at stake in this conversation. If some wish to simply dispense with certain techniques or canons, then they may also be overlooking the very means through which we may be able to unlock power. Consider for a moment the ingenuity of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in building her case for equal representation for women. That's right. Her case was actually built around a man. These are the very shadows that come to enrich the ideological nature of representation itself. And this is also exactly what Holbein's use of one point perspective in the iconic depiction of the ambassadors tells us. A painting not only rich in its realism of worldly material conquests, but also devious in the ways in which anamorphosis is called on to dismantle the centrality of vision within the same view. Holbein reminds us of the ephemerality of our point of view, pitting the material world against the inevitability of our mortality as depicted in the surreal overlay of a mysterious skull, a smudge from one perspective transformed into an uncanny monument to realism from another. Correspondingly, Understanding the order of L'Enfant's plan for Washington DC goes hand in hand with understanding the beguiling and insidious order of gerrymandered districts all around the United States. Order comes in many forms. And though these techniques are a part of our expertise, they too can be appropriated by others with equal ease. This points to the precarity of our position as artists and architects, but it also underscores the urgency of our actions. That is, if we wish to be part of that conversation. As artists and architects, if the formal, spatial and material calisthenics are part of our intellectual investment, then we must ask to what degree are we willing to own them, to demonstrate a responsibility over them and to dare to speak to power where our medium is exploited to other ends. For today, here and now, the simple question is actually whether you take pleasure in this process of discovery or whether the painful truths of our cultural instruments become a burden for you to confront, the very reason for brushing them under a carpet of denial. So, you came here for a simple graduation and look where we've ended up. All we really needed to do was to celebrate this moment together, to rejoice and to throw our caps into the air. So let's take a moment to figure out how to dig ourselves out of this hole of doom and gloom. To the parents in the audience who are wondering how schools prepared their daughters and sons for the world out there, I'm here to give you a bit of comfort. As deans and teachers and as planners, we work tirelessly to calculate every inch of our curricula, our courses, and the structure of our schools. And yet none of that actually determines the cultural vitality of the academic environment, nor the certainty of the future of your kids. When we do well, the best we do is to create an ample looseness such that the students are able to discover their own agency in their education, in effect, to lead it themselves. And when we do well, we give it just enough structure for them to feel tethered to something, even when we know that that something is insubstantial. More importantly, when we succeed, we create an atmosphere, something less quantifiable and allow them to see the world from multiple points of view, in empathy, as it were, what I've been trying to communicate in different ways this evening. But when we do really well, we teach them to gain pleasure in the particulars of their metier. Large ideas matter, but so too do the details of the means and methods by which they get there. 
And lest we get sucked into the positivist mandate of solving problems, of growing economies, and of building success, then this is a gentle reminder that we need to become more comfortable with asking the right questions first, sometimes opting for the restraint of reduction rather than the opulence of growth. And in this process, redefining success by embracing the risk of failure. Some of you today will be rid of school once and for all. And to you, I wish you all a genuine success to build the lives you so want to pursue. But as you move on, I want you to consider the question of pleasure one more time. The sheer desire imparted by the prospect of learning long after you've graduated, in effect to remain a student in perpetuity. As the accidental academic that I am, this is a gravitational pull that has kept me close to the school as an institution for some decades not only to support it, but to question it, to challenge it, to redefine it, and even to overturn it. Equally so, the studio space that is at the core of our lives is one that I continue to yearn for, whether at school or in my office. The very uncertainties that await there, the speculations, the little surprises, and some of the larger discoveries, that is the space of pedagogy that is unlike any other. It is not so much the work, but the prospect of endless play. That is what I hope you remain in love with. But also the idea of building a debate with people long gone centuries ago, as much as constructing conversations with those yet unborn. These are the simple pleasures of the academic environment that I so love and hope I can seduce you to do the same. Now that, my friends, is the redemption I had tried so hard to evade. Happy graduation to each and every one of you. Congratulations on a well-earned degree and good night to you all.